It was definitely noisy. It's not something you forget. World War One shell shock. World War Two. It was called malingering. They used to just shoot because it was a weakness, and the army didn't like to call it PTSD. Targets do fall when hit, even if that target is another, another human being. I um, mean, you hear gas, gas, gas for real. Kind of puts things into perspective. It's so when you wake up in the wee small hours, you know that's it. It's that's you and and your demons, I guess. Um, and yeah, I was I was pretty close to to ending it. Soldiers in modern warfare have been kicked to the curb. I always knew I wanted to be a soldier and I um, grew up quite, quite poor, I didn't have much in the way of money and uh, back then I just always had this desire to, to just like do something with my life and for me there was no other option, I was going to be a soldier. Joined the army straight out of school and I was like this is for me, it was the best thing I ever did. A succession of people in my family were in the Royal Marines, my father was the last one before me. Um, and I, I grew up in a military family and I couldn't wait to join. As soon as I was, had the opportunity, that was me straight in. I served in a variety of places, uh, operationally Northern Ireland first off. Um, I went to Cambodia, Bosnia, various parts of Africa. Two thousand and three. Um, you know, I was sent to I was sent to Kuwait as an interrogator. So I'd, uh, I'd, I'd done the yeah, I'd, I'd done all the courses. I knew all the theory. Um, um, what I didn't expect was the absolute psychological horror of, of being an interrogator. Yeah, and and when. You do that to, um, you put so much fear into that individual that they lose control of their bodily functions. You know, that's, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's something that, that takes some, 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 uh, it takes some processing, you know, but that never, those chickens never come home to roost until way after the fact. When you really get into war, there's things that you can't train for. Um, and I experienced uh, some of the worst things I've ever seen at a young age. I, I've seen um, families hurt and killed and murdered. And, you know, there, there's bodies. There, there's a lot of things I've seen. And for me, it was uh, the first thing I really struggled with was a very up close encounter with a kid that had got uh, blown up by a landmine. I can see his father and I can hear his mother. Um, the screams that, you know, it's just utter loss. It's not something you can, if I could, uh, I would try and get rid of it. I did try very unsuccessfully and it's just part of my, it's part of my life. I was medically discharged um, and they, they called it adjustment disorder. Um, but I did not have adjustment disorder. I had a psychological um, disability at the time called post-traumatic stress disorder. It's not just a, a mental health condition that affects the mind and the emotions, the emotional system, but there is actually an alteration in the brain caused by exposure to traumatic events. Most of the information is just filed away. When information is very traumatic, so when a trauma hits our brains, it's kind of like a boulder hitting the system that the brain can't quite file it away properly. So what it does is the information is broken down and laid down in kind of like a side cupboard in your mind so it's not filed away it's almost as if your brain cleverly shunts it to the side so you get little snippets of visual images and you get uh, bits of emotion 
what the person will start to do is find ways of pushing them back, trying to get the cupboard shut again. Nobody liked to say PTSD, but uh, PTSD was not an accepted injury or an illness. And uh, it, was the, it was the beginning of the end of my career. They should not have sent me home the way they did, because I went home alone um, without being able to uh, de-stress. And after seven months on tour, I was just a mess. And I went AWOL and I was fighting at home. I was drinking a hell of a lot. I was so angry and I was hurt. I was hurting because of everything I had seen in Kosovo it was just starting to kind of come to light. The emotional anguish of trying to keep it suppressed. Um, you, there's only so long you can keep it down. Um, it definitely wasn't accepted that you've got mental health. And they just got rid of you. I was medically discharged. Um, and I didn't really notice what was going on at the time. Um, it was put down as depression. It was. It became more and more, more, and more evident that there was something wrong. Um, and in true fashion, I hit it, blocked it, ignored it, did everything to sweep it under the carpet until the carpet wasn't big enough. <laughs> I couldn't really hide from it anymore. I was, I was, I was drinking heavily. Uh, I, would, I wouldn't go out. When they did go out, I'd end up going out on a three-day bender, just absolutely smashed. The whole idea of actually going on, it becomes doesn't seem very uh, very desirable. And I, I knew something wasn't right. Yeah, I, I just knew. I'm not a stupid man, but it's still hard to admit it. And I didn't admit it. It was forced upon me when I woke up in a prison cell. And uh, I woke up with my kilt on after a, a wedding and I'd been arrested. And everything just crumbled around me. My life just crumbled around me. That's PTSD in full swing. That's it winning. That's it taking over your entire world. Um, the only thing that kept me going really, I had two dogs at the time, um, another Springer and a Black Lab, uh, and they gave me purpose every day, really. They were the two things that, that kept me going. Um, that was, yeah, I think that was pretty much it at the time. <laughs> I'd got to the point that a friend of mine had Take, try to take his own life. Um, about, I think about six, eight months prior to me leaving. And he, yeah, thankfully he failed. <laughs> um, and I was on antidepressants at the time. They'd recognised that I was not in a good place, so they'd done that. I, had, I didn't get much in the way of psychological help. It was just put on, to, on, on medication. I start to think suicidal thoughts, and I I I tried stupid shit, you know, like I put knives to myself and I took pills, and I once let go of the wheel of my car doing 55, 60 mile an hour, car went right off the road. I couldn't couldn't live with seeing that image of that kid being blown up. Couldn't couldn't handle it anymore, especially with you know being a father. Uh, I was still in the military at the time and I still had access to weapons. I had a, a pistol and I took it home. I should have done um, at that point. And I, uh, I was going to shoot myself. A friend of mine had attempted it about six months before, four, six months beforehand uh, and had failed. He'd stuck a pistol in his mouth, pulled the trigger uh, and survived, lost his left eye. Um, how the hell? No idea. And I thought, well, I'll, I'm not going to stick it in my mouth. I'll stick the pistol. I'll stick the barrel in my eye socket. So at least I know it's it's going to go through my head and not just bounce through the the cavity at the front and ricochet out. Um, so I thought I le learned from his mistakes and I'll do it right. Um, but in my kind of indirect way of saying goodbye to people, just phoning people. One of them was a friend of mine who I'd known since I was four, and he picked up on something in. For whatever reason, that day he put the phone down, got in his car, and drove from Bournemouth to, to North London, and uh, rang my doorbell as I was sat there with the like that with the pistol in my eye socket. Um, 
that I joined the military when I was 16, straight from school. Um, and I met Jamie when we went to Iraq. He was a sniper in the infantry. I was in the artillery. So then we ended up getting married three years later. He loved it, he loved it. I think it hit him more when he left because he missed being able to do that job. Last night, I took an overdose. I don't want to I try to kill myself. I try to take my life or try to commit suicide. Name it any way you like. He used to have YouTube videos, uh, Facebook videos. Did you see them? started to panic and uh, that night I went home and I had some really really vivid no very nice nightmares and didn't sleep well at all and just really bad thoughts of suicide were coming in and all that all that jazz. I don't feel like it. I can't of cry. I feel I'm crying inside every day. I'm like really badly crying. I can feel myself getting hysterics, crying inside, real emotional. There's nothing can come out. When the first time he'd done it was when the real shock it came. But I think because then everything kind of went back to normal. Um, you know, we'd just been on holiday. Things were good, so. I didn't necessarily think he would go, it would happen the second time and that would be it. I think, you know, he planned it very well where we were down in Devon with my mum and dad. He was here on his own working. He had made sure, like, his mum and dad wouldn't be up. He planned the ambulance to come before. So everything was, he had it in his head, you know, it was set in his head that that's what he was going to do. And, you know, we had letters and stuff like that. He had piled all the stuff up, so he knew it was all calculated, all planned. So he was so strong-willed, just thought it would be a tough time, but he'll get through it in the end without, you know, without the suicide at the end. So you know, no one could quite believe it. I don't think. I think if you know it happened to him, it could happen to anyone. Even with the big major military charities, there's it was everybody they all run off the same protocols and process as the NHS, um, and it makes it very slow and cumbersome when it takes somebody so long to put their hand up to ask for help, and then they have to wait a month, six weeks for an assessment to then wait nine, twelve, eighteen months for treatment. That's why people give up. I didn't know that there was help available. And by the time I got round to asking for help um, and getting some psychological input and, and structure and help for me, um, I was told that the waiting list was 18 months. And I remember feeling, um, I'm not going to be able to last that long. I, as a psychologist working in secondary care mental health, I would offer psychological trauma-based therapy. 
Um, so we would assess the person first and then think about you know what that particular individual needs. On paper, it looks great, but in terms of actually accessing it um, and accessing the right treatment, because you know the world leading experts in trauma all say that trauma needs to be an integrated process. It needs to be tailored to the individual, not square peg round hole, <laughs> which is what the system tends tends to do. The standard treatments for PTSD and trauma in the UK are uh, trauma-focused CBT and EMDR. So people get crammed down two different paths. Because it because we're so proud and stubborn, and because we take so long to actually admit to ourselves that we need help, but when we do, we you know, kind of toes on the edge. Um, and then having to wait, guys are just guys are checking out because it's just it's too, they just can't do anymore. And time isn't something, it's when you're feeling suicidal, time isn't something you have. You, know, you need help there, you need help there. Yeah. You shouldn't have to ring a charity or try and find somewhere else to go and get help. We should been, you know, there should be somewhere before you even leave. You should have, have you know, at least the tools to be able to help yourself at some point yourself and not rely on other charities or even put it onto the NHS because why should they have to pick up the bill after the MOD again? You know, they should be the ones that are providing this service. You know, I feel sorry for people who work in mental health in the NHS because they're undermanned, they're under-resourced um, and they're not, it's not fair on them equally as it's not fair on, on the patients that they that they need to, who need their services, and, and unfortunately, the NHS, as you probably know, is a really stretched um, organisation, and mental health within the NHS is probably particularly stretched, and we just really don't have as much resource as we would like, um, you know, for for all patients who require yeah. mental health care and treatment. The NHS. He had a few CPNs, went to the doctors, but like I said to you before, the CPNs were in and out, they changed all the time. Nothing really was, just more medication, which I don't think helped either. In Grampian there's, there wasn't, I mean, even now, there's not a lot of resources. Um, yeah, there's pamphlets and leaflets, um, but there's not a real amount of aftercare for the ex-forces. A lot of people that want it, a lot of people that need it and deserve it. Uh, unfortunately, Combat Stress and all the other big charities don't have any reach up here. Everything pretty much stops around about the Dundee area, and then upwards of there is is very, very little. I don't think there should be charities. I'm glad there is, but I don't think there should be. The, the fact that we need them is a problem. Um, but we've got them and it's the best we've got right now. In an ideal world, it would be good to think that there were structures and systems in place that could deal with that. And in the absence of that, third sector and voluntary organisations are, are stepping in and doing a really good job.
Ultimately, friends, remember this one thing. No matter how hard it is and where you're going in your life, you are and you always will be someone worth fighting for. Um, are you doing okay? Are you struggling? Are you feeling good? Are you not feeling too great? Um, have you been making any plans? You know, are you taking care of yourself? Are you getting enough sleep? You know, how's your how's your head? How's your mindset? How's how's your heart? How is you? And um, basically, is what I'm asking. 